Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is the Integrated Approach to Management of Lung Cancer. Um, my name is Ian Hunt. I'm one of the co-chairs, along with uh, Doug West, Elizabeth Belcher and Eric Lim. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker discussing targeted therapies, uh, a, uh, a medical oncologist that I know very well. And, and I'm lucky enough to work with him uh, at the Royal Marsden, Professor Sanjay Popat, um, who is a professor of uh, clinical oncology at the Royal Marsden Hospital and also an honor honorary clinical senior lecturer uh, at, the, at the Molecular Genetics and Genomics Group uh, at the ICR as well as being the chair of BTOG, and I'm sure many of you will know of him and his reputation. Uh, so it's great pleasure I, I open this session with Sanjay's uh, talk on targeted therapies. Well, I'd very much like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on this really important to topic of targeted therapies in the session entitled Integrated Approach to Management of Lung Cancer. These are my disclosures. There are three areas to discuss in today's topic. Uh, these are consolidation TKIs after radical chemo radiation, the role of adjuvant TKIs and the role of neoadjuvant TKIs. So what's this all about? Why is this interesting? Well, we know that non-small cell lung cancer adenocarcinoma or non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer is a genomically complex disease consisting of multiple genetic aberrations identified within a cancer cell, all resulting in switching the cancer cell on, resulting in cell growth, division, and replication. And we know that in stage four non-small cell lung cancer, if we identify patients with a specific genotype, and we can dr then drug that genotype or the genetic alteration with dramatic and durable response with very good clinically meaningful outcomes. So therefore, we generally have the paradigm in which advanced non-small cell uh, lung cancer stage four is divided into two basic biological types. Those which are oncogene addicted, characterized by mutations and fusions such as EGFR, ALK, ROS, BRAF, RET, et cetera, where immunotherapy has little, if any, effect, and these patients are best treated with kinase inhibitors or TKIs. And the other group, those which are oncogene wild type, uh, which we think are immune addicted, where immunotherapy is now standard and chemotherapy may or may not play a role. Now, in stage four disease, we actually want to genotype for at least seven, if not more different genetic alterations, or at least these seven different genes for consideration of targeted therapies, which are now approved either by the FDA or the European regulator with a number of different drugs around the corner. So how can our knowledge of molecular oncology for stage four non-small cell lung cancer be integrated into the operable setting? Well, I would say we're now here. So I've got five principles that I think you need to understand. Principle number one, in stage four non-small cell lung cancer, despite dramatic and rapid responses, TKIs are not curative and relapse is inevitable despite ongoing treatment. Stopping drug results in rapid relapse. So will this be the same for stage one, two, and three? For stage one to three, how long should TKI continue for? Principle number two, in stage four non-small cell lung cancer, patients with genetic alterations do not, by and large, benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Principle number three, genetic alterations that are activating and can be drugged are rare. EGFR mutation is the commonest druggable alteration in the West occurs in a between five to 15% of non-small cell lung cancers. Therefore, getting randomized data is challenging, if not impossible for other rarer genotypes, such as ROS1 fusions. We do have trial data on EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, but trial data and other alterations will be challenging. Principle number four, TKIs cause pneumonitis, some more than others, and interactions with radical radiotherapy and SBRT need careful consideration. And principle number five, downstaging to result in pathological uh, complete response or major pathological response is a good thing, but is not proven to correlate with disease-free survival or overall survival in non-small cell lung cancer as yet. So therefore, 
let's take this group, consolidation TKI after radical chemo radiation in stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Well, this is in fact an old concept. <clears throat> we initially evaluated this concept back in 2008. This was the SWOG group the, who, who presented and published the very important S0023 trial. This is in the era before we knew what EGFR mutations were. And here, patients completing radical chemoradiation were randomized to receive either placebo or gefitinib, a first generation EGFR inhibitor. To everybody's shock and horror, the hazard ratio for uh, gefitinib was actually inferior with a hazard ratio of 0.633, with inferior and significantly inferior overall survival for gefitinib versus placebo. Now, this Whilst the TKI was not given to EGFR mutant patients, it was in all comers set back the field of integrating TKIs into radical treatments by at least a decade. Moving forward, we're in the world of immune checkpoint inhibitors and we're in the world of Pacific. We know that consolidating chemo radiation with Devalumab has strong and meaningful survival benefit. This is the four year uh, uh, PFS benefit, demonstrating a huge PFS benefit for Devalumab in the ITT, mostly EGFR wild type population. But when we look at uh, outcomes, and this is overall survival here, for patients with EGFR mutation positive disease, we get the hint that there's a, perhaps an uncertain, possibly poorer overall survival in EGFR mutant uh, non-small cell lung cancer with increased number of overall survival events. Also, if we're giving these patients Devalumab, when they relapse, we're going to give them osimertinib. Now, this prior Devalumab exposure increases the risk of serious toxicities and is not ideal. They're therefore a very uncertain benefit for Devalumab in EGFR mutation positive patients. Therefore, AstraZeneca is looking at uh, looking to consolidate patients following chemo radiation if they're EGFR mutation positive with an EGFR inhibitor, the third generation EGFR inhibitor, osimertinib, in the LORA trial. Here, patients will be randomized to receive either osimertinib or placebo, and they're going to be treated until objective radiological disease progression. And importantly, the primary endpoint is not overall survival, but progression free survival. Well, what about the adjuvant setting, looking at TKIs after curative surgery in non-small cell lung cancer? This is the great uh, concept that we want to prove. Well, in fact, again, this is an old concept. Let me take it a step back. We know that adjuvant chemotherapy has a modest but important survival advantage at the five-year time point, and this varies by stage. These are the data from the lace Finrelbin meta-analysis, and you can clearly see at the five-year time point, there's an absolute 8.9% survival advantage, and this increases by stage. And for many years, overall survival has been the primary endpoint. We, in fact, looked at adjuvant TKIs, looking at Tarsiva or Erlotinib back in 2014. This is the RADIANT trial. And at this time point, we weren't really sure what EGFR mutations did. Here in this trial, patients that had curatively resected stage 1b or 3a non-small cell lung cancer had either chemotherapy or not, and they were, then were randomized to receive either erlotinib or placebo. We see here in the top right-hand panel that disease-free survival was markedly improved for erlotinib compared to placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.61. But the problem is, is that overall survival was not uh, improved at all because these patients who were just followed up following their chemotherapy, when they relapsed, they all, or the majority of them, received erlotinib. Also, the problem is that the patients that received allotinib when they relapsed, and we look at the sites of metastatic relapse, there was a high rate of brain failure. And this may be because uh, allotinib does not penetrate the brain that well. Well, since then, we've had multiple trials of first and second generation EGFR kinase inhibitors, but this time in the EGFR mutation positive subgroup. And what these have shown is all very much a similar finding, which is the two-year relapse-free survival rate is actually quite good at anywhere between 75 to 80% for most uh, uh, across all of these trials. 
And this translates to a very strong uh, hazard ratio in the one and only randomized trial of gefitinib versus chemotherapy in EGFR mutant patients that had undergone resection. Here, the relapse-free survival hazard ratio is 0.6, so strong, a strong a relapse-free survival benefit for adjuvant gefitinib. However, overall survival was not at all improved in this large, uh, large Chinese uh, randomized trial. Really questioning if there's a benefit, therefore, for EGFR kinase inhibitors uh, at all. Now, moving forward, we have the modern current EGFR inhibitor, the third generation EGFR inhibitor, osimertinib, and this has been evaluated in the ADORA trial in patients that had undergone standard uh, uh, surgery for stage 1b or 3a disease and either received chemotherapy or not. This was a large international randomized phase 3 trial and patients received either osimertinib or placebo for three years. Here we see an unprecedented two-year relapse-free survival rate of 90% versus no osimertinib and this translated to a relapse-free uh, hazard ratio of 0.17. And on this basis, uh, the uh, Data Monitoring Committee uh, felt it ethical to unblind uh, the study. When we look at this uh, trial data, we see that osimertinib not only reduces disease recurrence in any location, either locally and distantly, but also importantly, reduces the rate of CNS relapse because osimertinib is a very good CNS penetrant drug. When we look at patients that received either adjuvant chemotherapy or no adjuvant chemotherapy, the relapse-free survival rate at two years is maintained at around 90%, even in those with, that receive chemotherapy and therefore have a slightly poorer relapse-free survival because presumably of their higher stage. This uh, important data then leads to three big questions. In the absence of an overall survival data, because the trial is too immature, because the huge relapse-free survival that was observed, is this big enough to change practice? Is anybody actually cured with TKIs, knowing that we don't see this in stage four disease, or does it just postpone relapse? And if it just postpones relapse, is this important enough? And number three, who really needs the TKI and who's cured without the TKI anyway? Who's receiving TKI over treatment? Well, what are the future directions in uh, adjuvant therapy uh, for uh, non-small cell lung cancer, which is oncogene addicted? Well, we see a number of other trials ongoing, for example, targeting other oncogene addictions or genetic alterations. Here are two big trials for ALK alterations. The ALENA trial is ongoing. This is a randomized phase three trial of patients with resected non-small cell lung cancer that is identified to be ALK positive, randomized to consolidation or adjuvant electinib or uh, indeed chemotherapy. And the Alchemist uh, trial uh, is taking patients that are having the standard adjuvant therapy and randomizing them to either cruzotinib uh, or placebo. Well, what about the neoadjuvant setting? Um, what about using TKIs uh, in patients with genetic alterations? Well, this is work ongoing. There have been several single arm phase two trials and one randomized phase two trial. If we talk about the randomized phase two trial, this is the emerging Tong 1103 Chinese study looking at neoadjuvant and adjuvant allotinib, which is a uh, first generation EGFR TKI versus chemotherapy in EGFR mutant operable N2 stage 3A lung cancer. So in this group of operable uh, uh, EGFR mutant lung cancer, should they be uh, having chemotherapy induction followed by surgery or allotinib, bearing in mind these are operable patients. What did the trial show? That there was an improvement in the response rate for allotinib versus chemotherapy. There's an improvement in uh, major pathological response. There was reduction in downstaging and a big benefit in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.39. But again, there was no significant improvement in overall survival because the majority of patients who receive chemotherapy when they relapse will have received an EGFR kinase inhibitor. And the safety profile was as expected for each of these agents. 
Well, moving forward, uh, we now have the uh, third generation EGFR uh, inhibitor uh, osimertinib, and this is being evaluated in the NEO Adora trial. Here, patients with resectable stage 2 and 3B non small cell lung cancer, which is EGFR mutation positive, are being randomized to receive either the standard of three cycles of chemotherapy, chemotherapy with osimertinib, or osimertinib with a view to then surgery looking at the primary endpoint of major pathological response uh, and pathological complete uh, response. So I'm going to close in summary by saying that non-small cell lung cancer with genetic alterations such as EGFR and ALK are unlikely to benefit from Im immunotherapy, which is what we know uh, in the stage four setting. Therefore, uh, the trials of immune checkpoint inhibitors have by and large excluded these patients. Relapse-free survival is increasingly being used as a trial primary endpoint, and this is because patients all receive the drug on relapse, confounding overall survival. The role of immunotherapy in consolidating stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer post-chemo radiotherapy in EGFR mutant lung cancer cases is unknown, and consolidation of simertinib TKI is being examined in the LORA trial. Adjuvant EGFR TKI treatment with osimertinib in the Adora trial demonstrates a massive relapse free survival benefit. But in the absence of overall survival data, which we may never get, is this really a new standard? Other adjuvant trials uh, in other genomic subsets, such as ALK fusions, are recruiting and will report all with progression free survival as a primary endpoint. Finally, the role of neoadjuvant EGFR TKIs is very encouraging for relapse-free survival and is being examined in the NEO-ADORA trial. Of course, we now know, therefore, that molecular characterization of operable non-small cell lung cancer is now standard and will drive perioperative treatment decision-making. I therefore encourage all of you to ensure that your patients that are undergoing surgery get molecular tested. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention. Hello, it's uh, Douglas West here. I'm one of the um, other co-chairs. Um, uh, thanks very much to Sanjay for a really fascinating um, uh, discussion there on TKIs. Um, it's now my great pleasure int to introduce my uh, colleague uh, at Cheltenham and Gloucester, David Ferugia. Uh, David is a consultant uh, medical oncologist. He uh, did his training at Guy's in St. Thomas's and his PhD at the Marston. Um, he has interests not only in lung cancer, but in mesothelioma and neuroendocrine uh, tumors, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what he has to uh, tell us about the role of immunotherapy in the modern management of lung cancer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Faruja, and I'm a medical oncologist. In this uh, afternoon session on integrated approach to the management of lung cancer, I'm going to talk to you on the role of perioperative immunotherapy. These are my disclosures. So what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is the treatment of cancer using intravenous monoclonal antibodies. These are directed at receptors on the T-cell surface, such as PD-1 and CTLA-4. Interaction of these receptors with their ligands, such as PD-L1, present on the surface of antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells, result in inhibition of the immune response. In other words, they are immune checkpoints. Tumor cells have harnessed this mechanism in order to evade immune surveillance. Immune checkpoint inhibiting monoclonal antibodies block the inhibitory effect of this receptor ligand interaction on immune surveillance. 
as a result, this causes immune stimulation and tumor cytotoxicity. The proportion of tumor cells that is expressing PDL1 on its surface can be measured by immunohistochemistry, and this is referred to as the tumor proportion score. In advanced non small cell lung cancer, this has been shown to predict for greater efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. A tumor that stains positive in more than 50% of cells is termed as TPS high, whereas those expressing PDL1 in less than 50% are termed TPS low, and those expressing PDL1 in less than 1% are usually regarded as negative. So looking at uh, a study uh, in lung cancer, this was the Keynote 024 study, and this specifically looked in patients with untreated uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer who had a TPS of greater than 50%. And these patients were randomized to receive treatment with either immunotherapy on its own with the agent pembrolizumab versus standard carboplatin-based chemotherapy. As you will see uh, on this slide, uh, the response rate to uh, pembrolizumab was superior to chemotherapy at 45% versus 28%. Uh, the progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, was also significantly prolonged at 10.3 months versus six months, while the estimated uh, survival at six months was also higher with immunotherapy. When immune checkpoint inhibitors were combined with chemotherapy in the first-line treatment of uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer, uh, these are the results from uh, one such study, Keynote 189, which shows uh, a randomization between pembrolizumab or placebo uh, together with chemotherapy. And uh, these are the co-primary endpoints of progression-free and overall survival uh, with updated results. And as you can see at the 12 month and 24 month time points, uh, both uh, PFS and OS are significantly improved with the uh, curves remaining separate. Interestingly, the outcomes were independent of tumor proportion score and the benefits were seen in all groups. So why use immunotherapy in earlier stages of uh, non-small cell lung cancer? Well, firstly, the magnitude of benefit that we have seen in advanced disease certainly has potential and should be looked at in earlier stages. In this setting, the lower tumor burden may favor the immune attack, and patients are often fitter with better performance status. As a result of this, their immune system may mount a more effective response, and they are also more able to tolerate toxicity. Proof of principle comes from this study in stage three disease, which uh, did not look at the post-surgical setting, but looked at uh, the effect of adding immune checkpoint inhibition to uh, concurrent chemoradiotherapy in patients with stage three unresectable disease. So these patients were randomized to either do valumab for up to 12 months or placebo once they had completed their chemoradiotherapy. The primary endpoints of this trial were progression-free and overall survival. And these are updated results uh, at a four-year time point presented by Dr. Favre Finn at ESMO last year. And they show that both co-primary endpoints of progression-free and overall survival uh, were significantly superior uh, with very impressive hazard ratios. And uh, the curves separate very early and remain separate throughout. So what about ongoing phase three trials of post-operative adjuvant immunotherapy? Well, there are several studies uh, summarized on this table, and uh, we will have to wait uh, for them to report uh, their findings as they are still ongoing. Uh, the strategy in these studies is very similar, although the immune checkpoint inhibitor use uh, does vary. 
So basically, uh, these patients uh, have received uh, immunotherapy uh, in addition to standard post-operative chemotherapy, which is platinum-based, versus post-operative chemotherapy alone. And this is being tested in stage 1b to 3 disease, with the primary endpoints being disease-free and overall survival. What might be the limitations of post-operative use of immunotherapy, however? Well, firstly, once the primary tumour has been resected, this reduces the neoantigen load and may therefore impair T-cell stimulation. Secondly, surgical stress and healing processes are known to induce a degree of immune tolerance. This is demonstrated uh, by increase in PD-1 and CTLA-4 expression and evidence of T-cell exhaustion. And therefore, these factors may hinder the priming of the immune system. On the other hand, in the neoadjuvant setting, the administration of immunotherapy when the primary tumor is still present may lead to enhanced T cell activation, and these T cells will then migrate into the circulation, seeking out micrometastasis. In order for immune checkpoint inhibition to work, it requires interaction between tumor cells, T cells, and antigen presenting cells. And there is a higher probability of this interaction occurring uh, when macroscopic tumor is present, such as the primary itself, uh, versus if only microscopic metastatic disease is present. Furthermore, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy enhances antigen presentation uh, by dendritic cells in the draining lymph nodes, and this leads to augmentation of T cell response. This table summarizes a number of phase two trials of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. And you can see these are small numbers of patients, but they do demonstrate some interesting findings. The column on the right shows the radiologic objective response, uh, whereas the column uh, to the left of it shows what is termed major pathological response. And this is defined as less than 10% of viable tumor cells remaining in the tumor after uh, Im neoadjuvant immunotherapy uh, when the specimen is examined by the pathologist. It is interesting that major pathological response did not always correlate with the radiological response in these studies. And there is possibly a trend towards a higher response rate in when immunotherapy is combined with chemotherapy rather than when it is used alone. These studies do raise further questions, however, such as how reliable is major pathologic response as a reproducible predictor of outcome? And also, what should be the target major pathological response that we should seek in current and future studies? Hopefully, these questions will be answered by a number of phase three trials which are ongoing in neoadjuvant immunotherapy. This slide summarizes uh, a number of them. And the strategy, again, is quite similar in these trials, whereby patients are receiving either immunotherapy with chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone in the preoperative setting. Once they have had their surgery, they then go on to receive either immunotherapy alone or uh, uh, go on to surveillance. The first of these studies, Checkmate 816, has reported some early findings in the recent meeting of the American Association of Cancer Research uh, in April of this year. And this was a study of chemotherapy with nivolumab versus chemotherapy alone as neoadjuvant treatment in patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer. In this study, patients received three preoperative cycles of nivolumab with chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone. 358 patients with stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer were randomized. And the pathological complete response rate for the combination was 24% versus 2.2% for chemotherapy, a highly statistically significant result. 
interestingly, the effect was regardless of stage, histological subtype, and also PDL1 expression. 83% of patients in the combination arm proceeded to surgery compared to 75%. And this demonstrates that the use of uh, combination treatment did not compromise the number of patients who proceeded to operation. Furthermore, the complete resection or R0 resection rate was also higher in the immunotherapy arm at 83% versus 78%. Treatment-related adverse events and also surgery-related adverse events were similar in the two arms. So in conclusion, immunotherapy on its own or combined with chemotherapy has established itself as a new treatment paradigm for advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Immunotherapy has shown long-term incremental progression-free and overall survival benefits when combined with concurrent chemoradiotherapy in stage three unresectable disease. Early non-small cell lung cancer may be more sensitive to immunotherapy as a lower tumor burden and better performance status may enhance efficacy and reduce toxicity. In the neoadjuvant setting, primary tumor may provide stronger and broader immune stimulation in order to prime T cells. Major pathological response may be a predictive as well as a prognostic marker correlating with early clinical outcomes in neoadjuvant immunotherapy and chemotherapy. Perioperative immunotherapy may present new challenges, however, with different preoperative toxicity and also long-term potentially life-changing adverse events in potentially cured patients. So as we move up the tree from using immunotherapy in, in advanced disease to post-operative disease and neoadjuvant treatment, the fruits of uh, better outcomes for our patients may be potentially bigger. However, in order to get to them, we will need to negotiate the longer ladder of uh, potential toxicity in patients who are cured of their disease. And with that, I'd like to finish and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you uh, to David Ferugia for a, an insightful talk uh, there on the role of immunotherapy. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Anoop Haradas, who is a consultant clinical oncologist and SABRE lead at the Clatterbridge Cancer Centre in the Wirral and the UK, uh, having previously worked as a consultant at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Um, he set up the SABRE service uh, at Clatterbridge um, and is a member of the UK SABRE consortium the National Committee producing guidance for the use of Sabre uh, in the UK and so it gives me a uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce him as he talks to us about the role of radiotherapy in the integrated uh, approach to uh, lung cancer. Good afternoon and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about radiotherapy in the integrated management of lung cancer. Uh, Manu Paridas, one of the oncologists from Clatterbridge Cancer Centre in Liverpool. Um, I'm going. To, these are my disclosures. I'm going to talk about radiotherapy in terms of its impact on the stage-based survival of um, lung cancer, starting with some survival statistics, going through the processes, uh, and then touching upon the future directions and at the end. Uh, start with some sobering statistics, less than 40% of newly diagnosed lung cancer patients survive beyond the first year, and less than one in six of these go on to longer term survival. Um, admittedly, these statistics are a bit old, but they haven't changed significantly uh, since the last eight years. Um, most of this is down to the incidence of the late stage cancers. 
and with more than 48% of lung cancers presenting in the metastatic setting and a further 20% in the locally advanced setting. Um, as you can see from the five-year overall survival statistics, um, early stage survival is quite good at 85 to 90%, which plummets to less than 10% by the time we get to stage four cancers. So catching these cancers earlier with screening programs and other would be one way of sorting it. And the other way would be to try and improve our management in the later stage settings. Um, at its most fundamental, radiotherapy is the use of ionizing radiation to treat cancers by creating oxygen radicals with these high energy X-rays and particles, causing DNA damage, which is poorly repaired by the cancer cells, leading to cell death. Um, there is a process involved, which after obtaining informed consent from the patient, most of them tend to undergo a 4D or planning scan with additional imaging. Um, this is roughly what it looks like for the scan of a patient with a peripheral tumor. Um, once these images are acquired, um, they are imported onto a planning system where the oncologist puts on a treatment volume um, seen in pink in this outline, um, which accounts for not just the tumor, but also its movement as seen and measured on the 4D scan. Um, after that, there is an addition of the organs of risk like the heart, um, central airways, lung, spinal canal, etc., and a margin around the tumor to allow for daily variations in the patient movement and breathing. And this blue structure around the tumor is called the planning target volume, and a radiotherapy plan is generated to deliver radiotherapy to that volume to a high dose, which is then approved by the oncologist. And the treatment is usually delivered on machines called linear accelerators, which are shown here, with the patient lying on a movable couch and the machine rotating around them uh, to deliver a collimated, uh, accurate beam of radiation to the appropriate tumor. Um, in perpendicular to the beam, there is imaging modalities, which is seen as a green flash over there. Um, which measures the patient's position as the treatment is going through. This is roughly an indication of what those images look like, um, showing that the tumor movement um, is measured in a 4D fashion uh, during treatment and uh, treatment delivery is kind of optimized to that. Uh, in broad classification, radiotherapy can be delivered as conventionally fractionated treatment which is small doses of daily radiotherapy delivered in 15 to 20 minute sessions over a one to six week time frame to a planned volume around the tumor. Um, if you deliver a higher dose of 50 to 70 gray, this can be curative. In lower doses, eight to 30 gray, they tend to be palliative. The pros of this treatment, uh, apart from its non-invasive nature um, and the fact that it's widely available, is that it can treat larger volumes, including node positive disease. It's non-invasive and has relatively low resource implications um, if you have a radiotherapy department. <clears throat> the downsides are as, as it has a lower efficacy as a single modality treatment with moderate toxicity and tends to have longer treatments. Um, the alternative way of delivering radiotherapy is to give stereotactic ablative treatment, which are larger doses of daily radiotherapy delivered in 15-minute sessions over a one to two-week time frame to a planned volume, which is fitted more tightly around the tumor with more stringent accuracy requirements. And the pros are it has a much higher efficacy, and it also has all the other advantages of radiotherapy treatment. It is a shorter course of treatment and therefore more convenient for patients. Um, the downsides are it can only treat smaller volumes and due to the higher toxicity on central structures like um, the proximal airways, esophagus, heart, etc., which do not tolerate high doses of radiotherapy in small number of sessions. Uh, it's not something that can treat central tumors or node positive disease. Because of its more technically challenging nature, it does have higher resource implications 
uh, for, for both the treatment side of things and from the staff. Moving on to stage-based management, um, in early stage, early stage node negative lung cancer, which is medically inoperable, um, the two options from a radiotherapy perspective are stereotactic ablative radiotherapy or SABR and conventional radiotherapy. Um, it's fair to say that SABR has largely superseded conventional radiation as long as treatment can safely be delivered. This is largely down to a fairly consistent record of local control rates in the range of 85 to 95 percent. And these are trials going back nearly a decade and a half uh, from 2005 on to more recent ones in 2016, 2017, which have all shown a fairly high local control rate uh, consistently across the, the patients treated. The survival, however, has fluctuated in a fair bit in most of these studies from as low as 40% in the UK-based study to as high as 90% in some of the studies from Japan. And the reason for this appears to center largely around comorbidities that the patients present with uh, rather than the dose or other variables. <coughs> Um, this is reflected in more recent data. This is from the Clatterbridge Cancer Center, um, looking at our five-year experience uh, over the last few years uh, in early stage node-negative non-small cell lung cancer. Um, SABR was safely deliverable with a low toxicity rate of less than 10% grade three or greater toxicity um, and very low uh, treatment-related mortality. Uh, median overall survival was comparable to all the published data, um, and most of the comorbidity um, determined the survival. So in this particular Kaplan-Meier curve, patients with no comorbidity essentially had 100% survival, um, whereas patients with mild comorbidity ended up um, with around a median survival of 42 months. Patients with severe comorbidity ended up with survival for around 19 months, which was a statistically significant result. Uh, in summary, SABR is considered standard of care in early stage inoperable, um, medically inoperable non-small cell lung cancer um, because of its low toxicity, high control rates, um, and safe deliverability for stuff. There's been a, a more generalized move to make this available to a more number of centers in the UK and worldwide. Uh, it has been compared head to head with conventional radiation and in early stage non negative non small cell lung cancer, it has better um, health related quality of life and lower toxicity compared to conventional radiation. And there have been two trials which have looked at this in detail one of which showed a better local control and progression-free survival in the SABER group, and in the other, both were comparable. So in terms of efficacy, they seem to match each other, although there is a criticism of the SPACE trial, uh, which did have a statistically higher number of higher stage tumors in the SABER group. Despite this, there was no difference between the survival between the two groups, indicating a trend for better progression free survival and local control in the SABR. Um, going on to the more controversial discussion, um, this would be for patients who have operable early stage node negative lung cancer. The treatment of choice would be and should be surgery for most of these patients. Um, SABR has become an alternative for some of these patients. Um, for various reasons, mostly to do with patient choice in a large number of centers, uh, and in some cases to do with uh, potential operative risk, especially in times of COVID. Um, the trials which have tried to look up at this question and answer it have largely been unsuccessful at recruiting enough patients, um, and the Sabre 2, STARS, Rosell, and ASCOG 4099 studies have all closed early due to lack of recruitment. There are a couple of trials still looking at this and hopefully over the next two, three years, we will get a bit more data to answer this question uh, in a better fashion. Um, most retrospective data supports surgical resection for the excellent survival benefit that it provides. 
in patients who are at high risk of surgical morbidity and mortality, um, especially those with medical comorbidity and elderly. Um, individualized risks need to be discussed um, before commencing any treatment. In locally advanced cancer, especially node positive cancer, there are several treatment modalities available, uh, including combinations of surgery, immunotherapy, and radiation and chemo and radiation on its own. And the reason for this is that locally advanced disease is quite a heterogeneous group with several aspects of it being potentially resectable disease, um, ideally with some debulking with some systemic therapy and some aspects of it making it inoperable, meaning chemo radiation would be the only favorable option. Um, and this is quite important because only about one in three patients with locally advanced disease actually undergo curative treatment in this country. And this was reflected in the National Lung Cancer Audit with a large majority of patients receiving best supportive care. So the larger number of patients we can get through curative treatment uh, in this relatively large group, the more chances we have of improving overall lung cancer survival. Um, radiotherapy in locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer has evolved over the years. So over the last three decades, the two-year overall survival has gone from 18% um, back in the 1980s to up to 66% when published in the Pacific uh, trial data, which used a combination of concurrent chemo radiation followed by immunotherapy. So it is gradually evolving to become uh, a safer, more effective treatment option. And uh, we hope to continue that trend over the coming era. And about 20% of all new patients present with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer um, and treating them with concurrent chemo radiation in the non-resectable patients may be the only um, curative option available to a lot of these patients. Although the overall survival is improving the longer term uh, five-year and curative rates are still poor. Typically, these are delivered as 20 to 30 sessions of radiotherapy over a four to six week time frame with the chemotherapy integrated into the beginning and the end of the treatment. And the option of adding in a more effective systemic therapy like immunotherapy after the concurrent treatment uh, in sequence um, has been a big advantage recently but does bring with it its own toxicities and morbidities that we will need to account for in the future. In stage four lung cancer, um, it's mostly used in a palliative setting uh, to relieve symptoms and improve control over the disease that is causing um, problems. Uh, increasingly a recognition of oligometastatic disease with limited spread of the cancer and use of stereotactic radiation in this has been um, increase improving outcomes for patients. In the palliative setting, um, this can be an emergency treatment like for spinal cord compression, or it can be urgent treatment for patients who have either uh, vena caval or proximal airway compression and can be used to palliate symptoms due to bone or brain metastases or bleeding from the airways. Um, all of these treatments are designed to improve quality of life and progression-free survival with a smaller impact on the overall survival. Um, over the last few years, the interest in treating oligometastatic disease has increased and there is now emerging evidence for a degree of survival benefit from the radical treatment of these tumors and their metastatic deposits. Uh, in the lung cancer setting, the SARON trial is exploring this for oligomets that present at uh, the beginning along with the primary. So in essence, treating the primary as if it was a stage three tumor and then ablating the metastatic disease with SABR uh, is the approach this trial has taken. Um, it is recruiting, albeit fairly slowly, uh, and will hopefully provide some answers as to whether this is a feasible option uh, in the lung cancer setting. For metachronous oligomets, i.e., disease that presents six or more months after the primary treatment, whether it be surgery or chemo radiation. Um, there is now published evidence from the Sabre Comet trial showing around a 12 month improvement in survival if we treat the metastatic deposits with Sabre 
in addition to standard of care therapies. The core trial, which is a largely UK-based study, has completed recruitment for this and hopefully we'll be presenting the data later this year or early next year about survival um, and how this treatment could help in this group of patients. Um, in summary, for oligometastatic disease, SABR, which delivers a high dose of radiation to small volume metastasis uh, with high local control rates and low toxicity, um, would be a helpful option, uh, especially if it um, can be delivered in synchrony with um, systemic agents like checkpoint inhibitors, which it appears to have synergy with. Um, in the UK, these are currently approved for routine use, um, and this was commissioned last year, and we can treat up to three metastatic deposits um, in various tumor sites like spine, lung, lymph node, adrenal, and liver meds using this technique. These are a couple of examples of a spinal metastases uh, in the lumbar spine treated with uh, stereotactic radiation and a right adrenal metastases uh, from non-small cell lung cancer uh, treated with um, SABR. Moving on to future directions and opportunities. Uh, in early stage lung cancer, we want to try and integrate immunotherapy into SBRT to see if that will help improve the survival numbers and essentially reduce the number of patients failing due to lymph node or metastatic failure and um, integrating it into the surgical pathway is an interesting question. Uh, and in the phase two missile trial, there was about a 60% pathological complete response rate when SABRE was used prior to resection of the tumor itself. Whether this will produce any survival benefit is not yet known. In the locally advanced setting, we want to try and use the immunotherapy uh, in the concurrent uh, phase of the chemoradiation regime. And there are a couple of trials like the CA20973L, which are currently looking into this very question. And in the future, for the fittest of our lung cancer patients, we want to integrate chemoradiation and surgery into their treatment paradigm and uh, to see if this will help answer some of our um, kind of difficult questions in terms of long-term cure. In the metastatic lung cancer setting, uh, treating more oligomets with curative intent um, would be uh, the forward looking way. Uh, and in the treatment setting of systemic therapy, showing one or two areas that are progressing or oligoprogression as it's called. Um, trials like the HALT trial are looking to see if we can ablate these resistant areas of tumor with SABRE, whether that will improve the outcomes in these patients. So a lot of exciting developments potentially in the future. In conclusion, radiotherapy can be quite a useful intervention for lung cancer patients at any point in the cancer journey. Uh, wherever local tumor control can help with symptoms and survival, do think about a referral. And um, smaller tumors are generally easier to treat and more successfully treated. So earlier referrals will facilitate this. And the hurdles in the form of detriment to quality of life are becoming less and less of an issue compared to historical perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker really needs no introduction. Dr. David Jones is a professor and chief of thoracic surgery at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and executive vice chair for the Department of Surgery. He's also the co-director of the Fiona and Stanley Druckenmiller Cancer Center and the recent past chair of the NIH tumor progression and metastasis study section, reflecting his own personal areas of research interest. Dr. Jones is the Secretary of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and is to be congratulated on hosting an amazing presentation and as well as a great annual meeting uh, last week. The Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has uh, a lot of experience internationally 
with the new induction agents due to participation in clinical trials and due to their preeminent worldwide position in this area, which gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jones, who will be speaking to us about surgery following from induction therapy. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I appreciate the kind invitation to participate in the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery in Great Britain and Ireland. I'm going to talk a little bit about surgery following uh, induction therapy as part of this session on integrated approach to management of lung cancer. Here are my disclosures. We're going to talk a little bit about pulmonary resection following immunotherapy first, and then we'll talk about resection following targeted therapies. The first paper to look at uh, the role of uh, induction uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors was the paper published in the New England Journal uh, of uh, Medicine by the groups from uh, Johns Hopkins and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and the pathologic responses, as you've probably heard by now, were robust with single agent uh, nivolumab with an NPR of 43% and uh, the realization that PD, PD-L1 uh, staining um, did not have any correlation with major pathologic uh, response. And you can see here the percent of pathologic regression uh, in this uh, bar chart. What about the surgery following the induction uh, NEVO study? Well, there were 20 uh, patients who went on to have surgery, 20 out of 21. 15 had a lobectomy. Uh, one, a bilobectomy, a sleeve lobectomy, two pneumonectomies, and one wedge resection. Blood loss was minimal uh, for the most part. Median length of hospital stay was four days. Uh, six resections were done th with a VATS or robotic approach. And of the 13 uh, procedures that started thoracoscopically, uh, about half were converted, most commonly due to fibrosis and treatment-related uh, scarring. There are several other uh, monotherapy uh, checkpoint in inhibition studies that have been either completed or ongoing. Uh, those are not yet published, only in abstract form. The next study I think is important is the study from Naya Rizvi and the group from Columbia looking at induction of tizuluzumab and chemotherapy, uh, a small phase two study of 30 patients who got four cycles of induction of tezo, followed by carboplatin and, 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 and uh, NAB paclitaxel. Each cycle was 21 days. Most of the patients had 2B or 3 disease, so more advanced local regional disease with a primary endpoint of NPR. The majority of patients received at least three cycles of a planned four, uh, and 97% of the patients had surgery with a near 90% R0 resection rate. Importantly, with this combined uh, chemo immunotherapy approach to induction therapy, there were no delays to surgery. And the median time from initiation of chemo to surgery was 20, or from completion of chemotherapy to surgery was 26 days. There was one 30-day mortality with pneumonia and no 90-day mortalities. The NPR rate was quite high at 57% with a complete pathologic response uh, of 33%, which interestingly was uh, more pronounced in squamous cell carcinomas compared to adenocarcinomas. Again, no correlation between PDL1 expression and tumor response. There were some IO related adverse events that we'll talk a little bit about what the thoracic surgeon needs to know. Here they had cases of some hypothyroidism, uh, hyperglycemia, and importantly, though, no uh, evidence of pneumonitis. There was robust uh, nodal downstaging, particularly N2 nodal downstaging in 70% uh, of patients, including a 60 including 11 out of 19 patients that went from N2 disease to pathologic N0 disease. Uh, similar to the nivolumab study, single agent trial, uh, lobectomy was the most common um, a procedure performed. Again, about 46 to 50% were performed thoracoscopically. There was no data on conversions. And I think we could say from this uh, study, very well tolerated, high uh, major pathologic response and very good pathologic complete response rates. I put this in because I think the surgeons need to be aware that with uh, this trial, there was no correlation between radiographic response and pathologic uh, regression. Uh, and this is shown by the pd one uh, here and by the degree of uh, radiographic responses measured by rhesus criteria stable disease, partial response, and progressive disease. And as you can see, 
some of the uh, patients who had very robust radiographic responses um, did in fact not have a very good pathologic regression, whereas others that had very low um, uh, radiographic uh, response were complete uh, pathologic uh, responders. The next study is that we're going to touch on briefly is the Nadim study, uh, which was a phase two study by the Spanish lung cancer group looking at resectable stage 3A disease, either N2 or T4 uh, lesions with no EGFR out mutations. There were initially 46 patients. Uh, they received nivolumab and paclitaxel and carboplatin for over three cycles. 41 of the 46 patients went on to surgery, and then the patients receive a one year of uh, adjuvant nivolumab. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival, and secondary endpoints are uh, response rates, overall survival, uh, and time to progression. Uh, this study was published multiple times in abstract form at ISLAC, and recently uh, published in Lancet Oncology in the fall of 2020. Um, None of the adverse events reported during induction therapy led to treatment discontinuation, dose reduction, surgery delay, or death. Again, I think an important consideration for surgeons uh, contemplating uh, enrolling patients on these trials. The NPR rate was uh, extraordinarily high at 83% with a pathologic complete response rate of 63%. And using the intent to treat analysis, the progression-free survival was 77% with an overall survival of almost 90% uh, at two years. And of those 26 patients who had a pathologic complete response, at least at, eight, at, at, least at a median follow-up of 24 months, only one developed a recurrence at 18 months, and that was a distant recurrence. Similar to what we've seen in prior studies, no correlation between PDL1 and um, response to th and, uh, uh, and survival or outcome, no correlation with TMB to response to therapy, and again, no correlation with response and pathologic, radiographic and pathologic responses. There's another paper that's in press uh, by Roman and, and uh, some of the other uh, Spanish surgeons who are really looking at the outcomes of the surgical resection that uh, will be published in the U European Journal of cardiothoracic surgery. It's actually online, and I wrote an editorial about this um, important uh, study. Uh, I think for surgeons uh, here, the, the Spanish group did a, a very good job. Invasive mediastinal staging was performed pre-enrollment uh, in 90% of cases. 73% of the cohort had clinical N2 disease pathologic proven, and 23% had multi-station N2 disease. So these are these are uh, certainly local regionally advanced uh, cases. Um, about 60% of the patients had a thoracotomy, which includes the conversions. Complete thoracoscopic approach was done in 42% of cases. And why did uh, they end up converting? Well, adhesions, difficult dissection, uh, and bleeding in two cases, although I would note that only one patient required a transfusion of one uh, unit of packed red blood cells uh, for the whole study. Again, lobectomy was common, including, I think importantly, the, the observation that parenchymal sparing uh, operations could be performed, including PA arterioplasties, a low incidence of pneumonectomies of only 7%. Uh, the postoperative complications were very similar to what we would see in, in a patient who, was, who had a standard lobectomy with or without induction chemotherapy. Uh, only one patient had a grade, uh, Clavian Dindo grade three complication. All other complications were grade one or two. It was an R0 resection in 100% of the patients. Uh, you can see a relatively short median length of stay with no 30 or 90 day mortality. And importantly, with the induction therapy and the surgery, 90% uh, of patients went on to receive at least one uh, dose of adjuvant uh, nivolumab. These are the current uh, uh, phase three randomized controlled prospective trials uh, going on with reported uh, with reporting dates here at the very right hand side uh, of the screen when they were initiated and when we could expect to see some of the data, which will be really in 2023 and 2024 uh, at the earliest.
A couple points uh, perioperatively, I think the surgeons need to be aware of when you're operating on someone who's had um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibition, and that's the increased risk of uh, immune-related uh, adverse events, uh, specifically endocrine dysfunction, more commonly hypothyroidism, uh, not so common hyperthyroidism, but it is reported. Uh, certainly colitis, particularly when uh, combined with CTLA uh, for antibodies, less so with immune checkpoint inhibitors and rash. Pneumonitis is actually pretty uncommon, uh, at least by what's been reported in trials. Uh, I will say that there was a recent report about two years ago by Suresh and colleagues in JTO that in the real world, there was a little higher incidence of uh, a pneumonitis of 19% uh, following immune checkpoint inhibitors. So it's something you need to be aware of. Again, less common uh, uh, so, uh, side effects of uh, checkpoint inhibition, uh, on, new onset of type 1 diabetes and adrenal insufficiencies. And there's some suggestion that to toxicities may be a little higher with combined uh, IO therapies um, along with chemotherapy and or radiation. So I would say what we know uh, to date that IO monotherapies are very well tolerated, good safety profile. Uh, the early feasibility phase two studies from Columbia um, and the Spanish lung cancer group suggest good anti-tumor benefits as measured by a major pathologic response and early, meaning at two years, um, uh, follow-up. But doesn't NPR translate to improved recurrence rates, uh, disease or progression-free survival and overall survival? We'll just have to see about that. Uh, we need more follow-up and many more patients, but that's what the phase three trial should give us. Uh, I don't think personally, after operating on many of these patients, that the operations are technically any more challenging than with monotherapy IO, or frankly, even with a standard a chemotherapy that uh, heretofore we've given as an induction strategy. We certainly need better biomarkers for uh, response, either radiographic or histologic. Uh, those are needed as well as why uh, certain tumors are resistant to immune checkpoint inhi inhibitors. It's clear that uh, thoracic surgeons need to remain involved in these trials uh, and, and be active uh, in accruing patients. In my last few minutes, I'd like to talk briefly about the neoadjuvant targeted therapy space and see where we are. This bar graph shows um, a number of somatic uh, genomic alterations and mutations that uh, are now known uh, about lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, the first and, and, and largest one dealing with uh, uh, EGFR uh, activating mutations. And I think we're all uh, aware of the seminal uh, publication um, by the ADORA investigators late last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, where this phase three trial of adjuvant osimertinib uh, in, uh, in stage 1B uh, two and 3A lung uh, adenocarcinoma had a dramatically uh, improvement in disease-free survival rate um, with a hazard ratio of 0.17. So this was really the first introduction uh, of uh, checkpoint inhibition or of uh, targeted therapies into the uh, resectable lung cancer space. But what about in the induction setting? There's really two small trials that I'm uh, aware of. There may be a few others that I missed, but this is one published just last month uh, from the group from Shanghai, 42 patients with an activating EGFR mutation, uh, that being uh, an exon 19 deletion or an exon 21 L858R uh, point mutation. You can see that um, uh, about 12%, uh, that should be 12% had clinical stage 1B disease. Stage 2 is 7%, and most patients had clinical stage 3 disease. The major pathologic response with, um, uh, an act with uh, uh, a, a level 1 or a level 2 tyrosine kinase inhibitor, inhibitor was 23%. Uh, the overall response rate radiographically was 47%. Uh, and there was no difference in the response rates radiographically based on what, which activating EGFR mutation they had. It was observed that the overall response rate and progression-free survival was worse with solid and micropapillary histologic subtypes, which is probably not unique to this study, but is common, uh, as you know, in all patients who have these subtypes. There were some limitations, obviously small series. There was no data on the surgical approach or toxicities associated with this 
regimen or surgical complications. Uh, and again, I mentioned there were no third generation uh, TKIs used uh, in the trial. This is another study looking at Jafitnib, um, a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, prospective single uh, uh, arm trial in uh, clinical stage two and three patients, 33. Uh, all patients had a thoracotomy, all patients had a mediastinal lymph node dissection. The 90-day mortality was 0%. All of the adverse events were, were uh, minimal uh, and a very long follow-up at five years, an overall response rate of 55%. Uh, and again, very similar to the trial I just mentioned, had an NPR of 24%. Uh, but the NPR patients did have a superior disease-free survival, but no impact on overall survival uh, as shown here in the Kaplan-Meier curve with a significance of 0 0.019 for uh, disease-free survival in those patients who had an NPR. What's coming or what's here? Uh, Neoadora, this is induction osimertinib uh, in EGFR mutant lung adenocarcinomas. Uh, again, stage two to three B patients with these activating EGFR mutations. They're randomized one to one to one to either chemotherapy three cycles Osimertinib plus chemo or osimertinib alone. All patients go on to surgery. They're assessed for their pathologic response as NPR is the primary endpoint in this study. And then it's investigator choice as to what adjuvant therapies will be uh, given. And I would imagine that literally all of these patients will receive uh, osimertinib given the results of the uh, ADORA trial. It's gonna be about 117 patients per arm. I anticipate this trial will, will quickly uh, move along uh, given the international uh, flavor of uh, all the sites. This is a trial uh, being done by the LCMC uh, group, the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium, along with the Thoracic Surgery Oncology Group and the LCRF, looking at 10 different genomic uh, perturbations that would be identified preoperatively, and then the patient matched to an industry-sponsored trial for the uh, genomic alteration. And you can see the 10 different um, uh, perturbations here. And the real uh, issues here are what are the major and complete pathologic response rates in patients who have, for instance, a BRAF, uh, V600E mutation, uh, a ROS1, uh, an NTRAC, uh, a HER2 mutation or amplification, uh, et cetera. And there are a lot of correlative studies that are planned in this uh, trial as well. So we're moving beyond EGFR in this study and looking again, how effective would these um, strategies be in a neoadjuvant setting? So what's the MSK approach to induction IO or targeted therapies? We typically wait about three to four weeks post-induction before surgery. We have seen, uh, particularly with checkpoint inhibition, uh, some changes in pulmonary function studies. So we repeat those before uh, post-induction, but before surgery. We start thoracoscopically on literally all cases just to make sure there's been no progression of disease, even if there's a thoracotomy plan. Uh, we've been able to improve our, our uh, minimally invasive resection uh, percentages up to about 50 to 60%. And, like all more local regionally advanced cases, it really depends on the, on the size of the tumor, the location, if the pulmonary artery is involved, et cetera. I think one thing that we've learned is that the bulky nodes are not always cancer related, particularly following a checkpoint inhibition. This nodal flare is typically a response to the checkpoint inhibitors and does not automatically mean that uh, there's persistent nodal disease. We do do a complete systematic uh, nodal dissection. I think that's very important. We don't routinely buttress uh, a bronchial stump uh, unless perhaps it's a right pneumonectomy, which we would routinely do. Uh, I do think that sometimes the post-tyrosine kinase in, uh, cases can be a little more challenging as some of these patients have ended up being on tyrosine kinase inhibition therapies for longer periods of time. Uh, but the bottom line is I think it's really uh, unfortunately unable uh, we're unable to predict which case is going to be tough or which case is going to be uh, relatively uh, straightforward. But we just aren't able to see that on, um, on imaging or, uh, or by careful assessment of the patient on uh, follow-up PET scans. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you today, and I look forward to uh, questions.
again, thank you. Okay. That's great. Some uh, really good uh, presentations today and uh, quite a bit to discuss. So maybe I'm going to start by kicking off asking a, a question to Professor Sanjay Pokma. Sanjay, it looks as if uh, early stage lung cancer is moving uh, slowly in the direction which you already have achieved in advanced lung cancer when new drugs and new agents were being introduced, but there was no evidence or rather funding for molecular testing. Uh, where do you see this going? Because in, in your talk, you mentioned that uh, you know molecular testing should become standard of care in uh, early stage resected lung cancer, but at the moment, there's no licensed uh, drug in the UK. Thank you. The license will come soon. Uh, the license for adjuvant osimertinib from the Adura trial has been submitted through a fast track route, which is something called Project Orbis, which we can now do post Brexit to the MHRA and EMA, and I anticipate that we'll have adjuvant or osimertinib licensed soon. The current genotyping reimbursement of molecular testing within England, not the devolved nations, within England, does not differentiate resectable cases from advanced cases. So all operable cases as of today within England should be getting genotyping. Once the MHRA approves the drug, it's then a matter for either the company to give free drug in a compassionate use basis or NICE to approve it. Either way, I anticipate we'll be in a position where we'll have adjuvant osimertinib available very soon in the UK for patients to derive benefit as per the ADORA trial. Therefore, it's absolutely critical that surgeons work with pathologists and oncologists to make sure that all of our patients are EGFR tested. And because molecular testing occurs on a panel, we'll not only get the EGFR result, we'll get many other molecular alteration results at the same time. Can, can I just follow up with the uh, uh, applicability of the testing? Because for EGFR testing, different centers use different approaches, some using COVAS, other, others using uh, NGS. Then how would you then uh, you know, um, ensure that there is a quality of standard for EGFR testing for early stage cancers? Thank you. Testing within England is all performed within the NHS Genomic Medical Service, which mandates that EGFR testing should ideally occur on an NGS panel. However, if the quality of the reception specimen is suboptimal, then different technologies can be used to salvage, such as COBAS, in which case you won't get the full panel, you'll just get the EGFR result. It's pretty straightforward to do panel testing on a reception specimen. The key issue is that every patient that's non squamous uh, where you're going to have a likelihood of EGFR mutation gets genotyped. We've been through this many, many years ago in advanced disease, non small cell lung cancer. Now it's time for early, treatable, curable lung cancers to undergo the same paradigm. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there's a question from the audience for Dr. Jones. Um, uh, uh, comment is a elegant summary for the Nadine study. Why did 40 to 50% had an initial thoracotomy and open approach. And in your experience, what's, what is the percentage of tissue and tissue planes being more fragile? Uh, also a little comment about uh, robotic surgery in this setting as well. Uh, David, I think you're on mute. No, there's a, there's a little blue button right at the bottom of the screen. Yep. 
I, I think while, while waiting for, <laughs> for David to unmute, um, there, there are some questions uh, about um, contraindications to SABRE. I don't know if anybody on, on, the, on the call can actually uh, address that with regards to how central the tumor and large size of more than five centimeters, whether or not that will still be suitable for SABRE in this, in this setting. Uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to comment. I don't know if David can. I think we have some technical difficulties as well uh, with, with David's side. I think uh, Sanjay, you are main, you are main contact person uh, today. So <laughs> I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm going to... Um, can you hear me sorry. now? Yeah, yeah great. Okay. Over to you. The floor's yours. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, on the Nadim study, but the question of, of uh, you know, the tissue fragility and, and tissue planes and how difficult it is, you know, you can start thoracoscopically, and if it looks like it's going to be a, uh, a challenging case, uh, the, the tissue planes are more fibrotic, you, you can't dissect out the nodes from the pulmonary artery, then you can, you can convert. But we've tended to, to really try to do these thoracoscopically. Uh, if we really think preoperatively, we think it's possible. If we don't, we still put the scope in to make sure that there has not been progression of disease and then quickly do the thoracotomy and do the resection. Eric, um, and surgical colleagues, I think this is, uh, from a surgical perspective, this is the sort of issue, isn't it? We, we know from Violet that uh, there's a short-term benefit in having minimal access surgery, and yet there's a sort of concern there that the, that the rates might be lower than we've been used to. Does, do, do any of the surgeons have a view on this? Are you excited or anxious? I'm both excited and anxious. I presume you're referring to minimally invasive surgery in the context of neoadjuvant versus adjuvant immunotherapy. So, so I am um, holding my breath. I'm waiting out for the ten trials to come uh, to to publish, and I'm hoping like chemotherapy, the hazard ratio is going to be the same before and after surgery administration. And if that's the case, then I think it will be much more straightforward for most surgeons who agree that upfront surgery for but for the adjuvant immunotherapy. From our point of view, we don't need to change our management. Uh, David mentioned quite a long series of uh, complications for neoadjuvant immunotherapies that we all need to be aware of. And that just adds layers of complications and difficulties for otherwise uh, straightforward lung cancer resection. And also, if that is the case where the neoadjuvant immunotherapy studies start producing great results better than that, then as surgeons, I think we will need to have more backup from medical colleagues, on-site patient uh, doctors who are specialists maybe in immunotherapy. And, I, and, and um, David Farouk, I wonder what, what your, your comments might be about that. I think that's a very important point, and I, I alluded to you know the, the black box of toxicity if you like that, that we don't we just don't know at the moment um, because our cancer treatments start in the ad, in the advanced setting and move up of course we are giving these treatments to patients to patients whose life expectancy is relatively short but when you then take these into the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting you've got potential uh, normal life expectancy in cured people and we, we already see that that these immune related adverse events can happen at any time so it's not just the pre-op period but it's what happens in the post-operative period where you're giving maintenance immunotherapy for say nine or 12 months and these unlike chemotherapy where most side effects happen while you're on treatment and then resolve very quickly with immunotherapy it can happen at any time during the treatment and sometimes these side effects are permanent for example endocrinopathies Yes. A question to Jones. Uh, on the same vein, I mean, the Royal Brompton Hospital is a standalone cardiac and thoracic surgical center and surgical and medical center. Uh, unlike the Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is a part of a wider hospital with all the support services, do you think that in the future, if we do uh, progress on to adjuvant immunotherapy, which I am sure is going to be the way forward, given that InPower 010 is going to be presented at ASCO very shortly, that's going to be the, the start of the new era of uh, you know integrated therapies. 
how important is uh, ancillary support or medical support uh, in this uh, setting? Yeah, so we've modified our preoperative kind of labs to re re reflect a little bit more of the thyroid function studies. We check those routinely now. It's not uncommon to have an endocrine consult preoperatively, which we would have never really done before with the uh, induction chemo. But in general, um, it's, it has not been too difficult. The, the few cases that we've had pneumonitis, that's where we've really needed um, extra uh, expert, you know, pulmonary medicine colleagues and critical care intensivists involved. But um, as you've seen, the incidence has been relatively low of grade three or higher pneumonitis following checkpoint inhibition on an induction setting. Um, but I think, you know, you definitely need to, to be aware of this. I, I'm a little uh, concerned about the adjuvant uh, checkpoint in, in inhibition and wondered what the group thought about using circulating tumor DNA as a uh, criterion as to whether or not you still need any adjuvant uh, checkpoint inhibition. I, I agree. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the major paths forward. Uh, and if we look at where we're going with adjuvant trials, the next round of adjuvant trials which are now recruiting are recruiting on the basis of minimal residual disease status post-operatively who really needs adjuvant treatment decided by ctdna so in the next two years we're going to have the reporting of the neoadjuvant and adjuvant trials which recruited three years ago now moving forward it's all about minimal residual disease by blood-based biomarkers and Sanjay, so, i just want to get your opinion on this other question on the neo adora trial since it really is a dealer's choice at the end, aren't all patients going to go right back on osimertinib? Um, so how how impactful will this trial be when all it can really look at is, um, you know, the pathologic or or major pathologic response rates? I think that, that, that that's right. From a clinical viewpoint, all the patients will get um, uh, adjuvant osimertinib as per the ADORA indication. However, what we're realizing with EGFR mutant disease, it's actually quite a heterogeneous group of diseases. And the genomic background of the patients really do uh, potentially impact on their prognosis and who really needs benefit. Remember, the problem that we've got from ADORA is because it reported so early, we don't really know who's getting appropriate treatment and who's getting over-treatment for their amount of disease. Perhaps understanding from the in, uh, surgical resection specimen, both the patterns of the residual tumor left and the genomic architecture, assuming tumor is left in those patients, will help us understand who really needs the adjuvant treatment and who doesn't. So can I present a con contrary point to that with regards to the importance of circulating tumor DNA? So from my point of view, cancer is what you can see and what you cannot see. And just because you resected it doesn't mean it's not there. Now, given that Adura has a hazard ratio of, you know, suggesting over 83% reduction in disease recurrence uh, and death, to me, that suggests that at least in 83%, you have residual disease. Otherwise, how are you going to benefit? And if that's the case, then we don't really need ctDNA. We can assume that at least 83% of our patients have residual uh, micromolecular disease. I think that's a very, very reasonable point, but it still begs the question of what happens in the remaining 19%. And three years worth of osimertinib treatment with paronychias, nail splinting, chronic diarrhea, um, skin problems, are in risk of pneumonitis, which osimertinib can cause, is still uh, quite a serious toxicity, let alone the financial toxicity, which many patients in the UK, to be honest, don't have to bear, which is the cost of the drug uh, alone. So there are very good reasons for understanding who needs the treatment. Eric, could I ask uh, the speakers what they think about tumour heterogeneity and the genetic diversity? Um, we like to think all of our surgical patients are cured. Unfortunately, they're not. Unfortunately, some of them relapse. When you have a patient who relapses, how important is it to get another biopsy, bearing in mind that biopsy will be very small, and how important is it to focus on that very large biopsy you had when you hoped you'd cured the patient? Well, I, you know, from my viewpoint, I think it's absolutely critical because we need to understand what subclone of the disease has actually grown out. 
Uh, and this can have a different impact on how we potentially treat the patient uh, forward. I think this is going to be more of an issue in the Adora setting. If we're treating these patients with three years worth of adjuvant osimertinib, and then we're stopping the adjuvant osimertinib, and then two years or a year and a half later, the patient's relapsing, what has that adjuvant treatment done to their disease so that it's now relapsed? Is it the same disease that you've just taken the break off and it's come back, or actually has the osimertinib changed the disease, as it does in the stage four setting, to modify the genetic architecture to turn it into something different? So certainly in EGFR mutant disease, we need to know that, and in any oncogene-addictive disease, we need to know that. I think the same is still the true uh, of non-oncogene-addictive disease. Uh, where we really don't understand the basic biology of why these cancers sometimes come back, even though they've been effectively cut out, given effective chemotherapy, and hopefully Empower 10 will demonstrate has had effective immunotherapy as well. So biology is absolutely critical to understanding. I think if I can just add something to that, I think it's important also to see whether, uh, for example, molecular biomarkers that, that have an influence on, on uh, immunotherapy are the same in the primary tumour and in the recurrent disease. And we just don't know, you know, we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface. On a more basic level, you're right, we need to make sure that it's the same histological subtype that's recurred as well, because sometimes, as you all know, a patient will survive one cancer only to develop a, a second one with a different histology. I agree. Excellent. Well, it's uh, 5 p.m. And I think that just leaves us to say thank you so much to all our speakers and especially also to the audience. We've had a great session today and, you know, stay tuned for to, uh, the next sessions coming up after this and as we continue for our sessions for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.